Okay, so I'm going to do my best to speed things up. We'll see how well I succeed. Um, but there are first a few questions here. Okay, uh, so I'll just, just answer them briefly. How can we find balance and avoid extremes? You know, there's so many areas in which we need to be balanced and avoid extremes that it's hard for me to say anything uh, in response to this, except, uh, you know, because there's, it could be in your study, it could be in training to be a, uh, an Olympia athlete, it could be in learning miniature golf, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not sure what, what the topic is here. Um, but in general, uh, I think we do what we can do and we don't do what we can't do. Yeah? And, and that's it. And we, you know, if we're going too far in one direction so that our mind's getting preoccupied with something and we're neglecting other things that are important, then to notice that and come back and, you know, recreate a balance. Balance is one of those elusive things that you never find, okay? So we always want to, you know, have balance in this and balance in that. But the thing is, whatever we do, the circumstances change five minutes later, and when the circumstances change, then your balance point changes. And there's no, you know, external, inherently existent balance point. So all I can say is, is it, do the best you can, and if you notice you're going one way or the other too much, then, yeah, then tell yourself to cool it. <laughs> Sorry if I couldn't give a really good answer for that. What would be a skillful way of managing afflictive emotions running amok while on the cushion? Now, who would have that experience? Yeah, I don't think anybody here would. No? Do you ever have that experience? Mm -hmm. Your mind going totally bonkers? You say the refuge and bodhicitta prayer, and then your mind is off and running until you hear. <laughs> and the whole session has gone by, and your mind is crazy. What do you do? You apply the antidotes to whatever affliction is in your mind, taking control of your mind. Same thing you do in the rest of your life. Yeah. So learn what the afflictions are. Uh, learn the antidotes to them. Practice the antidotes even when you don't have the affliction manifest. And then develop this ability to monitor our own mind by having introspective awareness. And when you notice your mind is in la-la land, apply whatever antidote to whatever affliction is present so you can bring your mind back to where it should be. Okay, then this one is interesting. It's a little bit long, so I don't know if I'll read the whole thing. Okay, so the question is, how does one cure an emotional automatism? I think what it means is being not as warm and fuzzy as one would like to be, okay? Because the example is given by somebody who is caring for his girlfriend who had a strep throat. And he said, luckily it isn't COVID. It's nothing serious, but she's obviously in bed and suffering. Personally, I am in some ways a great nurse. Logistically speaking, do you need water? Your pillow fluffed? And I do it. But as for nursing with warmth and maternal concern, I just cannot do it. I want to very badly, but instead I shut down. My throat constricts. I truly can't, even though I want to. Instead, I sound matter-of-fact bordering on cold. There's some underlying fear or something. It happens despite my wanting to be otherwise. 
Even with my sick cats, I am like that. But if my pet or loved one is dying, finally I can express those emotions. The dam bursts and I am finally free. Okay, and then uh, there's kind of a PS which said that actually uh, within a few days of writing this story, this uh, the girlfriend died because she had COVID. Uh, no, she did not have a strep throat but had an undetected blood disease. Yeah, and so she died. Uh, and so he walks through life unable to express love when he wants to, trapped in a disobedient and locked up mind. So the question is, how can one work with the mind to free oneself from these ingrained and reflexive, protective, but destructive habits of mind, which actually restrict expression of emotions one feels? Don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah? Uh, you know, who's ever saying this? Really, don't be so hard on yourself. You seem to have some ideal image of what a warm, fo fo uh, fuzzy, uh, you know, companion who is emotionally open should be and do and you can't do it, and you beat yourself up. And I think that mechanism is the problem, you know, because we have an image of, you know, what I think I should be. But, you know, you are what you are, and I think if you relax about the whole thing, it, you know, then whatever come, emotion comes, comes. And, you know, don't have this thing that you put on yourself, like when you're taking care of somebody that you have to flutter around them all the time and, are you okay? And I love you so much and please get better and, you know, have some chicken soup. I made vegetarian chicken soup especially for you, you know and all this kind of stuff. You may have that idea that that's how uh, a warm person acts and that's what your, your friend wants. But maybe it's not the kind of care that your friend likes. Yeah? I don't know about you, but I don't like when people flutter around me always saying, do you want this? Do you want that? You know? It's like, I'd much rather somebody who does what they feel comfortable with, relaxes. If you want to express emotions, you do. If you're not in the mood, you don't. Yeah. Instead of having some kind of expectation of oneself. Hmm? And I think relaxing in that way, then whatever blockage there is, you know, kind of won't be a problem. It'll disappear. Of course, this is a question for a therapist, and I'm not a therapist. Do you have anything you want to add to this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Because sometimes we are so hard on ourselves and have such images of, you know, the perfect me should be like this, you know. And if you're in a relationship where the other person wants you to emote more and is saying, I want you to emote more and tell me what you're feeling and, you know, this is how we bond and... And if you feel that pressure from somebody else, then that's even, that makes you constrict even more. Yeah, because there's this image of what I should do to please this other person. So. Okay, so. We're on page 205, halfway down, 
extending this insight to others. So His Holiness says, now that you have identified the mechanics of misery in your own situation, you can extend this insight to other sentient beings suffering the same miseries. However, for your response to be love and compassion, it is not sufficient just to know how other beings suffer. You must also have a sense of closeness with them. Okay. Otherwise, the more you know about your enemy's suffering, the happier you might be. As Sankapa says, in the world when suffering is seen as an enemy, not only is it not unbearable, but you delight in it. Yeah, in an Okay, let's start over. I knew something didn't make sense. In the world, when suffering is seen in an enemy, not only is it not unbearable, but you delight in it. When persons who have neither helped nor harmed help nor harmed you are seen to suffer, you will, in most cases, pay no attention to their situation. This reaction is caused by not having a sense of closeness with respect to those persons. But when you see friends suffer, it is unbearable in the sense that you want to do something about it. And the degree of unbearability is just as great as your sense of closeness to them. Therefore, it is essential that you generate a sense of strong cherishing and affection for sentient beings. Okay, so when they talk about generating love and compassion for others, they usually say two factors are necessary. One is awareness, uh, contemplation on other beings suffering, and the other is a sense of closeness to them. The sense of closeness um, can uh, be developed in different ways in the technique of the seven um, in set cause and effect instructions. It's developed by meditating that all sentient beings have been our parents and then their kindness when they've been our parents. And in the Shanti Deva's method of equalizing, exchanging self and others, um, this sense of closeness is developed by just reflecting on the kindness of, of sentient beings in general uh, in terms of how we all live in a society and we exist due to the kindness and efforts of other living beings. Okay. So I won't go into that now uh, because otherwise we won't finish the book. <laughs> True love and compassion rise on the basis of respecting others. This feeling of empathy is achieved by recognizing that you and all others, whether friends, enemies, or neutral parties, share a central aspiration by wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, even if you view happiness and suffering differently. So we may see certain things as conducive to happiness and other situations bringing suffering. We may differ in that. But in wanting happiness and not suffering, we're all the same. You know, some people see going to the beach as, you know, being happy, and some people see going to the beach as miserable. Okay? But everybody wants to be happy. Also, it helps to be aware that over the count the course of countless lifetimes, everyone at some time has been your mother and your closest friend. Yeah, so really, again, here we come to the big picture. And the big picture always entails thinking beyond this one lifetime. So it's very possible to take Buddhist methods and practice them uh, without believing in rebirth. You can still practice them and benefit from them. But to get the whole meaning of what the Buddha is teaching, we have to be able to look beyond this lifetime because this lifetime doesn't last very long. Yeah, And so here, you know, some uh, belief in rebirth or at least an open 
mind that says, could be, you know, um, is very, very helpful. Yeah, because this big view gives you the inner strength to, to continue developing uh, your wisdom and compassion over a long time. And it also, when we look at other sentient beings, thinking of their being reborn again and again in samsara, you know, really brings a strong feeling of, of compassion, wanting them to be free of that. Whereas if you just think, well, being born in this life is suffering, and that's it, then, you know, what's the method to stop their suffering? Uh, let them die. And that's not very good, is it? Okay, so uh, having that long-term view is is really allows you to, to feel more strongly what our situation is as sentient beings and to cultivate a deeper sense of love and compassion. Yeah. Because otherwise, if it's just this life and that's it, then wanting other sentient beings to be happy, basically you want them to have the happiness of this life, the eight worldly concerns. Yeah. And you don't think of them wanting to the happiness that comes from the Dharma because after they die, there's nothing. So whether you practice the Dharma or not, it doesn't matter. Okay? So this is why I think, uh, you know, exploring rebirth, or at least opening our mind towards that, can really add a lot of depth to our practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. With this prerequisite sense of closeness and intimacy with everyone in place, insight into how sentient beings wander powerlessly in cyclic existence serves to heighten love and compassion. In the presence of intimacy and insight, the factors of love, compassion, and a desire to help others arise without difficulty. So maybe this is talking to that person who wrote the last question, okay? So here he, His Holiness talks about intimacy. Intimacy simply means a feeling of closeness, okay? It doesn't, how to say, there are different ways to be intimate with someone, okay? Very often in our culture, we create friendship or intimacy by sharing our emotions or sharing our stories, of uh, the stories of our life, something like that, you know? Um, yeah, by talking about our personal experiences and our past happiness, our past pain, what our family relationships are like, and so on. And we often create in a feeling of intimacy and closeness through that. Um, having lived with Tibetans in Tibetan culture for a long time, that's not the way the Tibetans create intimacy. Yeah, they create, they don't talk about emotions and tell each other their life stories and all this kind of stuff. The way they create intimacy is you reach out and you do something practical that helps your friend. Yeah, without being ass or with being ass. And so it's often, yeah, just uh, small indications of friendship, going out of your way to do something, helping somebody uh, you know, with a chore, whether they asked or not. And this creates the feeling of intimacy in that culture. Okay? So I think if we can make ourselves versatile in creating intimacy, it may be much easier for us to connect. And that could be maybe having something to do with that person's question. Okay? Because we, we do show intimacy in very different ways, and we show love in very different ways. And sometimes 
we have our idea of if you love me, this is how you would show it. Yeah? And we expect the other person to know what that is and act in that way without our telling them. But not everybody is the same, and people express love and affection and respect in very, very different ways. And so if we just have one way that indicates to us that somebody cares about us, then we're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities to connect with somebody. And we're not going to be able to recognize the affection and closeness that other people do feel for us because they're showing it not in the way that we think they should. Okay. Does that make some sense to you? Okay. Um, you know, there's many kind of examples of that. Um, let me see if I can... Think of something offhand. Well, just in these intercultural things, yeah, um, just to know that some people, the way they show closeness and affection is they can't come over and help you clean your house or they help you move or something like that. Other people show their affection by buying flowers. Yeah, Other people show their affection aff affliction, affection, by, you know, opening up and telling you a story about their life. What is one method, person's method of showing intimacy and affection may not fit with another person, okay? For example, this thing about giving flowers, okay? So there's one place where I, I go to teach, and the people in that center love fresh flowers, okay? And so I go, and there's fresh flowers all over the place, okay? I look at fresh flowers, and I say, they're beautiful, but they're so bad for the environment because they're grown artificially, then they're cut, and then they have to fly them uh, on planes very quickly to get to the marketplaces so they can be sold before they fade. And so the petrol involved in, in doing this is, you know, it pollutes our world. And to me, pollute, you know, abandoning, polluting the world is much more important than having beautiful flowers somewhere. Okay, so I have to stop when I go to this center and they have flowers and I have to keep my mouth shut and say this is how they're showing affection and respect. And I receive that affection and respect and I'm glad we have that connection. And sometime when there's the opportunity, I will explain to them that Please don't buy fresh flowers, okay? Um, so, you know, there, there's where somebody else, boy, somebody brings you fresh flowers, that means they really care about you, yeah? To me, it's just like, okay, something else I have to do something with. You know, it's nice. I offered them to the Buddha, and I'm very happy about that. And then in a few days, they're dead, and then I have to figure out what to do with them. Okay, so everybody has something different that, uh, you know, that makes them feel good. But we have to keep our mind open that people may show affection in a way that uh, does not correspond to what we want. Okay, another example. Okay, Aunt Ethel. Yeah, she's 85 years old, and she invites you over to dinner, and she makes cabbage and chickpeas <laughs> and, and uh, kidney beans, you know, just what your stomach can't handle. And, and you're eating... And there's a few other things, you know. She makes some other stuff that you can't eat, but she does this this stuff that you can't eat. And 
And in the middle of the meal, Aunt Ethel, 85 years old, you know, who spent all day cooking, asks you, how do you like the food? Okay. Now, do you tell her the truth and say, Aunt Ethel, I can't eat any of it. It stinks. Yeah. Or do you do you tune in to what she's saying? She's saying, I love you and I care about you. And this meal is my way of sharing, of showing you that I care about you. Yeah. Do you understand that? That's what her question really means. Okay. So you have to, you know, you don't say, Aunt Ethel, like, please don't invite me over again, Um, you know, or just give me a TV dinner or, you know, whatever it is. You say, Aunt Ethel, I really appreciate that you spent all day cooking um, a special meal and that you thought to invite me over to share for it, to share it with you. And I really treasure our relationship. Number one, that's telling the truth. It's not lying. Number two, it's opening our heart to accept that that's how she shows love. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So just to be aware of this. And, and when we are, it gives us so many more opportunities to feel close to people. Because so often they're, they are showing affection that we just don't pick up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then, meditative reflection. Bring a friend to mind and cultivate three levels of love. Okay, so I'll just read through this. This is is your meditation outline for tonight. Okay, meditate on this tonight. So first you bring a friend to mind, and then you're cultivating three levels of love. So the first one is this person wants happiness, but is bereft of happiness. Okay, how nice it would be if he or she uh, could be imbued with happiness and all the causes of happiness. Okay. Then the second, this person wants happiness but is bereft. May she or he be imbued with happiness and the causes of happiness. And three, this person wants happiness but is bereft. I will do whatever I can to help him, her or him to be imbued with happiness and all the causes of happiness. So this is... Uh, like the long version of the four measurables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we start out with how wonderful it would be, how nice it would be. That's just a wish, you know, and if, yes, may they have happiness in its causes. Then we move on to, yeah, may they be, may they have happiness in its causes. Okay, first one is how wonderful. Second one has more energy. May they have that. Third one is I'm going to get involved and make that happen. Okay, so in the long version of the four measurables that we do when we do the Thousand Arm Chenresi practice, this is exactly what it's like. That version has a fourth, which is requesting... uh, Chen Resi to inspire our mind to make that happen. But the first three parts are exactly the same here. Okay? So meditate on that. And this way you develop the love uh, gradually. You know, how wonderful it would be. May they have it. I will do something to bring that about. Okay? Then cultivate the three levels of compassion. This person wants happiness and does not want suffering, yet is stricken with terrible pain. If this person could only be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. So again, that's, you know, if they could be, how wonderful it would be if they were. Okay. 
Then the second one is this person wants happiness and does not want suffering, yet is stricken with terrible pain. So in all of these, the situation is exactly the same. The first sentence is the same. The second one, yeah, the second sentence says, may this person be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Okay, so that's upping it. Then third, this person wants happiness and does not want suffering, yet is stricken with terrible pain. I will help this person be free from suffering and all the causes of suffering. Okay? So this is how you develop that feeling of love, those feelings of love and compassion in your mind, by meditating like this and thinking of uh, examples of people in your life. Yeah, you're not going to develop love and compassion by saying, I should be more loving, I should be more compassionate. How come I aren't? I, I'm not, I don't feel anything. Uh, what's wrong with me? That's not going to get you there. Okay? And so this is when I said that one of the beauties about the Buddha's teachings is that the Buddha teaches us exactly how to think to develop the kind of mental states we want. This is a really good example. You know, here it is laid out for us in an outline form. And then we train our mind again and again in doing this. And as we train our mind and repeat it, then the feeling comes more and more. Okay, then next step is now cultivate total commitment. Okay, so you've seen the sentient beings wanting happiness, wish, and you want to give them that. You see them suffering, you want to free them of that. Now you think cyclic existence is a process driven by ignorance. That we learned when we went through the bucket example. Okay. Therefore, it is realistic for me to work to achieve awakening and to help others do the same. Because if I can eliminate my ignorance, which is the source of my samsara, then I can teach other living beings how to eliminate their ignorance, which is the source of their samsara. Okay. And then the third step is, even if I have to do it alone, I will free all sentient beings from suffering and the causes of suffering and set all sentient beings in happiness and its causes. At this point, you get nervous. <laughs> no, I'm joking. You go, what? You know? I will free all sentient beings from suffering, the causes of suffering, and give them happiness and the causes of happiness. Oh, I don't know how to do that. That's too much for me. And plus, it says, even if I have to do it alone, can't I have some help? You know, I mean, there's all these Buddhas out there already. Can't they help some of the sentient beings? Why do I have to generate that intention to do, to liberate all sentient beings and to do it alone? You know, it's impractical and the Buddha should help share the load. <laughs> okay, says our mind. Um... The thing is, when you're doing the bodhisattva practice, you generate aspirations that are far beyond what you're capable of. Even if you should become a Buddha, you're incapable of fulfilling these aspirations. Even a Buddha can't liberate all sentient beings alone, because if they could, they would have done it already. Okay, They have all the skills and the wisdom and everything to do it. But Buddhas are not all powerful. So the reason we do these kinds of aspirations and make these kind of statements is to increase our love and compassion. Yeah. Even though we may never be able to do what we're saying, what we're wishing, what we're aspiring for, just by saying and thinking like that, 
it increases our love and compassion so that when a situation comes in front of us where we can help, we've already made these kinds of aspirations, and so it becomes so much easier to say yes and help. Whereas if we don't make these aspirations, these unreal, unrealistic aspirations, then even somebody asks us to help with the dishes, we don't want to do it. Okay, So this is all a method to stretch our mind and help us overcome our self-centeredness. But when you um, get into it and, you know, read the aspirations that the bodhisattvas make, it is so inspiring. It takes your mind completely in a different place. And you really think, I want to become like that. I really want to be able to do that. I don't care practical or not. I want to be able to do that because it's so wonderful just thinking that there are living beings who have that kind of depth of love and compassion and wisdom and courage, and I want to be like them. And that does wonders for your mind when you can feel like that. Okay? And it opens us to then be able to do whatever thing comes in front of our nose, okay? Whereas if we're always making our aspirations very practical, then we don't stretch our mind, yeah? Because the extent of our aspiration may be, may I help whenever somebody asks me to do the dishes, you know? <laughs> So, yes, some days when we wake up in the morning and we have a feeling that somebody's probably not going to show up for dishes and we're going to get asked to do it, we do create that aspiration because we have a feeling it's going to happen that day. And we say, when somebody asks me to help with the dishes, I'm going to say yes because I realize it's an opportunity to offer service to sentient beings. Okay? And you create that motivation. Okay, so that's that's a good way to start, and then build it up. Yeah. Okay, one by one, bring to mind individual beings, first friends, then neutral persons, and then enemies, starting with the least offensive. Remember, I told you the usual recommendation is start with people; it's easy and make it more difficult. And repeat these reflections with them in mind. It will take months and years, but the benefit of this practice will be immense. You know, And it does take a long time, but the benefit is immense because it releases us from our anger and our jealousy and our resentment and our belligerence and so on and so forth. It brings a lot of freedom in our heart. Okay, so I know our country politically is, has, is very divided. There's a lot of animosity floating around where even masks, little pieces of cloth like this become an issue over which some people argue and even get violent. And somebody even got killed over a piece of cloth like this. Yeah. So when this kind of uh, feeling is in the country, uh, generating these thoughts is really, really helpful because it makes you look beyond the appearance of this person in this life. And it makes you look like we did this morning this is a sentient being just like me, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, whose mind is under the control of ignorance, afflictions, and karma. And then that helps you to open your heart towards them. Okay? What I often do to help in that regard is uh, when we do bowing 
Yeah, just as when we take refuge and generate bodhicitta, we imagine the, all the holy beings in front and all the sentient beings around us. When we bow, same thing. We could do the same visualization. So include within the sentient beings surrounding you when you take refuge, when you generate bodhicitta, when you bow. Include all the, the politicians and groups of people that you have rigid, harsh stereotypes about. Put them in your visualization, okay? So I often have the U.S. Congress in my visualization with the president in front and dear Mitch there and Nancy on the other side, and we're all looking at the Buddha and taking refuge and generate, generating bodhicitta. We're all bowing and putting our nose on the ground together. Yeah. If you visualize like that, it really helps you uh, um, deal with that hardness that sometimes overcomes us in uh, a political environment like this. Yeah, whatever group of people, you know, now I put in the visualization these big guys, you know, with their AK-47s <laughs> standing in front of the, the state capitals, uh, you know, uh, saying, I want my freedom to get COVID, <laughs> um, you know, uh, put, I put them in it, you know, put whoever it is that you need to in there. If, if there's people in your personal life who have harmed you, put them in the visualization. And, you know, have them all be looking at the Buddha Dharma Sangha for refuge, you know, to pay homage, and to witness your generating uh, the altruistic intention of bodhicitta. Okay, very powerful to do it, and do it over and over and again, you know? So it's kind of cute sometimes. <laughs> you know, you're doing this visualization of bowing, and there's Donnie, and he's so fat he can't get down, you know, and he can't get up. But you forget that, and in your visualization, he's full of faith, and he goes down with respect. He comes up with respect. Yeah. So it, it, it helps the mind a lot when you can do that. Okay? Give it a try. You know, as well as for individuals who may have harmed you personally, who you are afraid of or who you have a very hard heart towards. You know, put them in the visualization. Okay, we finished one chapter. Chapter 22, Reflecting on Impermanence. So here's a uh, quote by Pacho Rinpoche. Pacho, I love Pacho Rinpoche. If you have a chance, read his book, uh, Words of My Perfect Teacher. Uh, his teaching is like Shanti Devas' way of teaching. Zoom! Right to the point. You know, got your ego right in the act, and you can't get out of it. I find it very effective. So he says, in Tibet, there were practitioners in retreat who so strongly reflected on impermanence that they would not wash their dishes after supper. So now you have an excuse <laughs> to ask somebody else to help you with the dishes. You've become a very high practitioner with a realization of impermanence. <laughs> okay. In this chapter, His Holiness says, I will explain impermanence, the first of two deeper levels of insight into the process of cyclic existence. So the second level of deeper insight is on emptiness, the nature of reality, which will be treated in the next chapter. 
Okay, so here we start with a metaphor for impermanence. So first of all, impermanence means something changes moment by moment. Okay? And permanence means something does not change moment by moment. This is different from eternal and not non-eternal. Eternal mean, means it lasts forever. Okay? Things do not have to be permanent to last forever. They can be impermanent and last forever. Like our mind stream. It's not going to cease. Okay? It changes moment by moment, but it, there's not going to be a final end to it. Some, imper some permanent things come into being and go out of being, even though they're not changing moment by moment. For example, the emptiness of inherent existence of something, of an object, is uh, permanent. But it comes into being when that object is created, and it goes out of existence when that object is destroyed. But the emptiness does not change moment by moment. Okay, just so what we're clear on what we're talking about here. Okay, so a metaphor for impermanence. A reflection of the moon shimmers on the surface of a lake rippled by breezes. So this is a metaphor in uh, Chandrakirti's supplement to Nagarjuna's uh, treatise on the Middle Way. Yeah, a reflection of the moon shimmers on the surface of a lake rippled by breezes. A huge river of ignorance that mistakenly believes the mind-body to be inherently existent flows into the lake of mix, uh, the lake of mistaking I as inherently existent. The lake itself is agitated by the winds of counterproductive thought, what we often call distorted conceptions or inappropriate attention. So the lake itself is agitated by the winds of counterproductive thought and of wholesome and unwholesome actions, so karma. The shimmering reflection of the moon symbolizes both the coarse level of impermanence due to death and the subtle level of impermanence due to the moment-by-moment -moment disintegration that rules sentient beings. The shining of the rippling waves illustrates the impermanence to which sentient beings are subject. And you are to see sentient beings in that way. By reflecting on this metaphor, you can develop insight into how beings are unnecessarily drawn into suffering by being out of tune with their own nature. This insight, in turn, stimulates love and compassion. Okay, so in Chandrakirti's supplement, he talks about three kinds of compassion. One is compassion for sentient beings. And that, that's the first one. And that is just seeing sentient beings as suffering sentient beings. And that's where Chandrakirti gave the analogy of the bucket in the well and the six, you know, similes there. The second kind of impermanence is, compassion. Yeah, compassion. Thank you. Is is seeing, uh, is the sent the compassion. Uh, I can't remember the actual translation. Um, huh? A phenomena, compassion of something with phenomena. Hmm? No, that that's the the meaning. Okay, so the me the meaning of this second compassion is your the object you're meditating on is sentient beings qualified by impermanence. Okay, the first one you're just meditating on sentient beings who are suffering. Here you're meditating, developing compassion for sentient beings who are qualified by impermanence. In the third one, objectless compassion, then you're 
uh, ob the object you're meditating on, is sentient beings who are empty of inherent existence. Compassion, observing. observing phenomena. I knew it was something with phenomena. Okay. So this second one, a, a compassion observing phenomena. Like I said, the object there is phenomena which are impermanent. In particular, we're seeing sentient beings as impermanent. When we can see sentient beings as impermanent, it really deepens our compassion because we look at them and there they are momentarily impermanent, changing in every single split second, but their mind is grasping onto everything being permanent and unchanging, stable, secure, and predictable. So when you see sentient beings, the reality, they're changing moment by moment. The way that their ignorant mind rejects that reality and sees everything as stable and firm and predictable and not changing, then you really begin to see how they suffer because of their ignorance. Yeah, because if you're wanting everything to be stable and secure, but it's changing moment by moment, you're going to suffer, aren't you? Because what you want is not what reality is. Okay? So that brings a whole new dimension to, to looking at sentient beings. Yeah. It's the first one, you know, sentient beings, just uh, with the bucket example. There we, we bring in how they suffer from afflictions and karma. But we're thinking more of they're getting born again and again. They're encountering aging, sickness, and death. You know, they have broken relationships and they lose their job and all these kind of common problems. Yeah. With the second one, we're looking deeper into how the ignorant mind causes these problems. Okay. With the third one, seeing sentient beings, uh, objectless compassion, seeing sentient beings as qualified by emptiness of inherent existence, then we're even going further into seeing how ignorance uh, causes the whole situation of samsara and all the dukkha in it. Okay. And so understanding that stimulates love and compassion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so realizing impermanence. We are under the influence of an illusion of permanence. So we, we think there is always lots of time remaining, right? Yeah, we're going to live for a long time. We can have a long time to practice dharma. This mistaken belief puts us in great danger of wasting our lives in procrastination which is especially wasteful when our lives are blessed with the leisure and facilities to engage in productive practices. So we have the freedom and fortune afforded us by a precious human life, and we keep saying, I'll do Dharma practice later. Right now, I'm busy. Okay, I have a career to get going. I have a family that I want to have. Uh, I have hobbies that I want to do and a social life and these kinds of things that I want to do in my life and I'll get around to spiritual practice later because there's plenty of time. Okay, so to counteract this tendency, it is important to meditate on impermanence. First on the fact that death might come at any moment, and then on the very momentary nature of our lives. Okay? So we're going to think about our own mortality and think about death. And uh, I like this me meditation because even before I met Buddhism, it was clear to me that people died, but nobody wanted to talk about it. It was a hush-hush subject. 
you don't talk about it. Because if you talk about it in my family, it means somebody might die. If you don't talk about it, maybe they won't die. Very practical, huh? So, you, you, you look, you know people are dying, but nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah, what does death mean? What does the fact that we're going to die, what does that have to do with our life and what, what our values are, what our priorities are, what we want to uh, do in our life, what is meaningful to us? People don't want to talk about that. You know, they want to go out and have a good time and make money and do all the normal things of the eight worldly concerns. <clears throat> One of the chief reasons desire and hatred arise is that we are overly attached to the current flow of life. We have a sense that it will last forever. And with that sort of attitude, we become fixated on superficialities, material possessions, and temporary friends and situations. Now we say, temporary friends? No, these are people that I've known my whole life. And we're really close, and I'm going to know them the rest of my life. They're not temporary friends. Well, how long is our life compared to beginning the samsara? Those friendships are temporary. <clears throat> we can't take those people with us when we die. And, contrary to popular belief, it's not like we're going to die and all wake up in heaven and be together again. Yeah. Yeah. From the Buddhist perspective, that's not like it. I remember when um, when George H. W. Bush died, there was somebody did a, a cartoon of because um, Barbara died first, right? Mm -hmm. So they did the cartoon of heaven. Barbara was there. I think they had a child who died as a, a toddler and an infant. Barbara was there holding that infant. I guess they were frozen in time because I don't know how long ago they died, but they never grew up. And George H.W. appears there in heaven and the family is reunited again. Yeah, and this is the um, way many people think of death um, because it makes them feel better. It's consoling if you like your family members and get along with them. Um, then this vision is very consoling. Okay, if you don't get along with your family members very well, then this vision is not so good. Okay, uh, but that's not from a Buddhist viewpoint, what happens? Okay. We go up and down in samsara. We are thrown or propelled here and there by our karma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So one... Uh, um, Okay, we have a sense that our life will last forever, and with that sort of attitude, we become fixated on superficialities, material possessions, and temporary friends and situations. To overcome this ignorance, you need to reflect on the fact that a day is coming when you will not be here. Okay, when we will not be here, and... Other people will be making dedications for our good rebirth. Okay? Hopefully. And we don't know when that's coming, but for sure one day it will come. And for people who believe that their family cannot live without them, 
your family will live without you. Yeah, the world will continue and we will be in another, reborn in another place in samsara. So give your friends and relatives some credit. They will adjust. They will learn to live without you. Yeah. Because this can arise strongly at death for somebody who's very attached to their family. Of I can't die because my kids need me or so-and-so needs me. I can't die. Can you imagine dying with that thought when you have no choice? Because, you know, when we're dying, we're, we're dying. We can't go, excuse me, I'm not ready. I want to postpone this. Can I break the appointment with the Lord of Death and make a new appointment for later when I'm better prepared? No, when we die, we got to go. Okay. And if we have a lot of attachment such that we're tormented when we die, thinking that other people will collapse without us in their lives, I think we're making ourselves a bit too important. Yeah. Let's give other beings uh, some credit. They can adjust. They can adapt. Even young kids. Yeah. Three of His Holiness's Dalai, Dalai Lama's translators, at least three, because I'm thinking of three off the top of my head, have lost their mothers uh, when they were young children. And they're wonderful people now, and they're adjusted, and they're fine. You know, Despite the fact of losing their parents and then being refugees in another country. So, you know, people will make it without us. Okay. Even though there is no certainty that you will die tonight, when you cultivate an awareness of death, you appreciate that you could die tonight. With this attitude, if there is something you can do that will help in both this life and the next, you will give it precedence over something that would help only this life in a superficial way. Wouldn't you? If you knew you were going to die tonight or could die tonight, you would give priority to things that could help you in this life and future lives, not to, you know, your reputation and if somebody repaid you the $5 that you loaned them 20 years ago um, and so on, okay? Furthermore, by being uncertain about when death will come, you will refrain from doing something that would harm both your present and your future lifetimes. So if we're aware of death, who wants to create negative karma when we could die soon and have to experience the result of our own unwholesome actions? You will be motivated to develop outlooks that act as antidotes to the various forms of the untamed mind. So you will learn the antidotes, how to meditate on impermanence, to, uh, to overcome attachment, how to meditate on love and compassion, to overcome anger, how to meditate on rejoicing, to overcome jealousy, and so on. Then, whether you live a day, a week, a month, or a year, that time will be meaningful because your thoughts and actions will be based on what is beneficial in the long run. So it's not just the long run of this life. It's the long run until we become Buddha. In other words, including future lives. By contrast, when you come under the influence of the illusion of permanence, and spend your time on matters that go no deeper than the surface of this life, you sustain a great loss. Okay? So when we're running around and, you know, we're distraught because uh, the deer ate all the tulips, and <laughs> we, you know, 
and were furious with the deer for eating the tulips. Um, you know, that's really not what we want to be thinking about if we could die tonight. You know, that's not where we want to put our energy. If you're getting flustered because uh, the computer is not working properly, you know, and you want to kick it because it loses your files or it doesn't save your files correctly, or, <laughs> or the screen changes. This is the new one on my computer. This, the uh, the um, screen changes, like we're not the, the task bar. Without me doing anything, it'll jump to somewhere else. And, <laughs> and the toolbar, half of it will go down and half of it will, will stay up, you know. So when these incredibly crucial things happen and you're being driven crazy and you're angry about it, if you think about death, you might relax a little bit. <laughs> because apples don't have touch screens. That's why. <laughs> the fact that things change from moment to moment opens up the possibility for positive development. So contemplating impermanence isn't just about separating from everything and everyone. Contemplating impermanence also means that we can change and develop and become Buddhas. Okay? So it's the fact that things are impermanent is also good because it means we can create the causes uh, for happiness and abandon the causes of suffering, and we can develop all of our good qualities infinitely. If situations did not change, they would forever retain their aspect of suffering. Okay? So change has its good sides. Once you realize things are always changing, if you are passing through a difficult period, you can find comfort in knowing that the situation will not remain that way forever. It is in the nature of cyclic existence that what has gathered parents, children's brothers, sisters, and friends will eventually disperse. Whatever comes together will separate. Things are transient. Things change. They're impermanent. No matter how much friends like each other, eventually they must separate. Gurus and students, parents and children, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, and the very best of friends no matter who they are, must eventually separate. Okay. Very good to make our mind really familiar with this. Because the more familiar we are with this, and the more accepting we can become of the fact that we will separate from the people that we care about, then when that separation happens, we're not going to flip out we'll be able to think about it in a constructive way. We'll be prepared. Let me give you an example. I received um, an email last night from a friend in another country, and there was a young man. It's someplace I've, I've gone a few times to teach, and there was a young man who I met uh, on the first visit there, him and, and his mom. He had a lot of different troubles, um, but he and I became friends. He was about 20 at the time, and we became friends, and, and we had a really nice relationship. And I heard yesterday that he died. He was like 23 in a really unusual, strange situation. They don't have the autopsy yet, so it's, the details aren't clear. And I was thinking about his mother and how his mother must be taking it because for parents, I think one of the most difficult things, at least as my mother kept saying to me, is losing your child before you die. You know, my mom used to say, I can, you know, 
I can lose this person, this person, this person. If something happened to you kids, you know. So that that was like something put on my head. Like, you can't die because it will make me unhappy. <laughs> you know. So don't do anything dangerous. <laughs> okay. But I was thinking Dasha is the mother's name. And I was thinking, boy, it must be really hard for her. And so the common friend who wrote and told me about the son's death, you know, I meant I said that to him. And he said, because he, he knew them very well, um, he said, actually, that the mother uh, had a feeling for a long time that her son would not live a full life mm -hmm. because he had certain difficulties and problems. And so she was uh, prepared for an early death. Mm. And he said that um, she seems to be doing OK with it. And that she said um, she was very glad for whatever time he was here on this earth. You know, so whatever time they had together, she appreciated it. And she was aware that it probably wouldn't be for a long time. And so now her child died, but she's able to handle it. Her practice is, you know, making her quite strong in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's basically familiarity with reality, you know. And the part of our problem is we are not in tune with the, the reality. We live in a fantasy and then suffer because reality does not correspond what our, fam our fantasy thinks it should be. So it's not the fault of reality. The problem is our mind of fantasy. So everybody must eventually separate. In addition to separating from all of our friends, all the wealth and resources of you who have accumulated. Okay, so all your bank accounts, all your stock, all your bonds, you know, all the things that have gone down in value <laughs> in the last month. <laughs> yeah. Um, all the resources you've accumulated, you know, no matter how marvelous they are, eventually become unusable. Yeah? I mean, look at the stock market. Whatever goes up is going to come down. And it may go up again and it'll come down again. And, you know, kind of get used to it. Or do something else with your money. <laughs> Yeah. The brevity of this present life will force you to leave all wealth behind. So all those souvenirs, all those family mementos, you know, all the things that have been passed down from generation to generation that nobody thinks about until somebody dies and that you're never going to look at but you cannot give away. You're going to have to separate from them. Yeah. You know all those things that you never look at but you can't give away? Somebody came to see me once and his parents had died and he had to clean the house out. And he was saying, you know, there are all there's boxes of things that are family mementos that I can't give away, but I don't want them. What do I do with them? Yeah. So this is the benefit of having siblings. <laughs> yeah, siblings with storage closets. <laughs> you give all this stuff to your siblings, and they will store it because you can't throw it out. OK. There's this picture that my parents took when my brother and I were young. This is way before my sister was born. So she doesn't have a picture like this. But for years, they had in their bedroom these huge pictures. I mean, like 
this big pictures, one of my brother and one of me, okay? So I was like, I don't know, four or five. And my brother was, you know, two or three. And these pictures were on their walls. I mean, every, in all the houses they lived at, whenever they moved, it's the first thing that went up, these pictures, okay? When my parents died and it came time to clean out the house, I was wondering, what are we going to do with those pictures? Because there's one of Russ and one of me. We can't split them up because our parents would not want them to be split up. They are a set bound in this life. They cannot be split up. But I don't want the picture of me, you know, but I also know it shouldn't be thrown out. And I don't want the picture of him either, but I know you can't throw that one out either. So what are we going to do with these two pictures? Because they were huge, you know, huge pictures. What are we going to do? Well, thank goodness. <laughs> one day, uh, you know, when I went down to, to help, the pictures were gone. I think my brother took them. I didn't ask. Because <laughs> I don't want to know if he threw them out or didn't. <laughs> or where he put them, if he has his picture in his house and my picture is in the back of the basement. <laughs> Huh? Does it have a good frame? Oh, it has a beautiful frame. <laughs> okay. So there are better some questions you don't ask. <laughs> okay. So the brevity of this present life will force you to leave all wealth behind. The Indian philosopher and yogi Shanti Deva speaks evoc evocatively of impermanence, saying that no matter how wonderful your present life comes to be, it is like a dream about pleasure, and then being awakened with nothing left except memory. Yeah, you might have a fantastic dream when you wake up in the morning, but do you have to show for it. You dreamt that you won the lottery. You dreamt that you had this fantastic love affair. You dreamt that finally all the people who haven't appreciated you your whole life now appreciate you. I mean, it was a wonderful dream. And what do you have to show for it at the end? Okay. As Buddha said in the Diamond Cutter Sutra, view things compounded from causes to be like twinkling stars Figment seen with an eye disease. The flickering light of a butter lamp. Magical illusions. Dew, dre bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. This is a different translation of the same verse as Venerable Sanke Kadro has been teaching from. When I am about to start a lecture, His Holiness says, in front of a large crowd of people looking up to me for wisdom and insight, I repeat to myself these lines about the fragility of everything and then snap my fingers, the brief sound symbolizing impermanence. So this is a standard practice when you're going to give a Dharma talk. You know, you think about this verse, you, you snap your fingers and thinking, you know, that's how long your life is or that's how long any moment of appreciation or fame or anything else is. This is how I remind myself that I will soon be descending from my current position. Any living being, no matter how long he or she lives, must eventually die. There is no other way. Once you dwell within cyclic existence, you cannot live outside its nature, and its nature is transience. No matter how marvelous things may be, it is built into their very nature that they and you must degenerate in the end. As the Buddha said, realize that the body is impermanent like a clay vessel. 
Okay, so impermanence is built into our existence. It isn't something that comes from outside, uncalled for. It's the very nature of uh, being a compounded phenomena, a conditioned phenomena affected by causes and conditions. So we're going to degenerate in the end, His Holiness says. How does that make you feel? Somebody's saying you're going to degenerate. No, I'm not going to degenerate. I'm going to get old. Okay, that sounds better than degenerate, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. But, no, I'm not really going to get old. I mean, old people, you know what old people are like. Yeah. I'm not going to get old. I'll age. <laughs> Gracefully. Gracefully. Beautiful. And I will, will mature infinitely, but I will not get degenerate and I will not uh, get old. Okay. I will just age. I will not get old. Hmm? And then every once in a while, there's this face in the mirror. <laughs> that doesn't match the face in your scrapbook, you know? Yeah. My brother recently sent me some family pictures because our aunt died. Yeah. So I'm looking at these family pictures, and it's like, I don't look like that anymore. <laughs> My brother doesn't look like that anymore either. And I'm not sure, in fact, which one is him and which one is me. Because <laughs> when you're really young, babies kind of look alike, don't they? Yeah? I had more hair then than I have now. <laughs> okay. But sometimes it really hits you, the reality. Or even... Um, uh, what is it? Like, this is graduation time. Everybody's graduating. So you might see or somebody might show you a picture of your graduation. You know? And like, that face and this face that I'm seeing in the mirror, what connection do they have? <laughs> yeah. They don't look alike. They don't look alike. I'm that one. <laughs> I'm that young one with the smooth skin. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> this thing. Okay. Good fortune is not permanent. Consequently, it is dangerous to become too attached to things going well. Any outlook of, per of permanence is ruinous. When the present becomes your preoccupation, the future does not matter, which undermines your motivation to engage in compassionate practices for the future awakening of others. By contrast, an outlook of impermanence provides the proper motivation. Okay, so good fortune is not permanent, and it's dangerous to become attached to things that are going well. Okay, so we're working hard to establish an abbey, to make a community of people online, offline, everywhere, it's going well, but we don't know what's going to happen. You know, people are trying to imagine life after COVID, and nobody quite knows what it's going to be like. Yeah, I mean, it'll still be life. Relax. But, you know, people don't know if they're going to be able to go out and get drunk in bars together or if they're going to have to get drunk sitting six feet apart. <laughs> okay. Now, 
Not only must you die in the end, but you do not know when the end will come. Oh, wait, I want to comment on this part from the previous paragraph. When he says, when the present becomes your preoccupation, the future does not matter, which undermines your motivation to engage in compassionate practices for the future awakening of others. So somebody's going to hear that, and they're going to go, wait a minute, I thought about being a Buddhist meant you be in the present moment. You don't think about the past, and you don't think about the future. And this is the Dalai Lama telling me that I should remember impermanence and think about the future enlightenment of sentient beings? Yeah. I thought I should just live in this present moment and enjoy things and be here now, as they say. Yeah. So how do you put that together? Yeah. In Tibetan, especially Tibetan Buddhism, when they say... Uh, that the future life is more important than this life? How do you put that together with be in the present moment? Yeah? Is something right? Is something wrong? What's the story? Yeah? One perspective would be to have the bigger picture of aiming for many lifetimes, future lives up to enlightenment, but bringing back creating the causes for that happiness in the present moment in terms of what can I do with my mind right now that can put it in virtue, that can be a benefit to the person right in front of me, that can apply the antidotes to the afflictions that are arising right now in my mind so that I can remain balanced, happy and helpful mm. within the biggest scope of seeing that over many lifetimes, over many days, years, that's all building up to the bigger picture of enlightenment. Yeah. yeah. I've been thinking like how... Um, in terms of this pandemic and people who are developing the vaccine, they need decades of training. And if you are a Buddhist and you're believing you don't even have time to wash your dishes, would you invest in that time? And when the pandemic hits, who's developing the vaccine if it's a truly Buddhist country? Mm. If everybody's in the mountain meditating mm. and the people, villages are dying, Okay, show me a country where everybody is in the mountains meditating. So, like, example, if today the Tibet, if Tibet in the olden days and the pandemic hits there, um, what kind of resources, what kind of, um, who will be developing the vaccine yeah. to help? You can still deal with present problems. You do it with a motivation of love and compassion. Okay? Preparing for enlightenment doesn't mean you find the nearest cave and sit in it. We have to create many, many different causes for awakening. Okay? And so we do different things at different times in our life. We spend different lifetimes doing different activities. So it's not like there's one ideal way and, okay, we're all going to go to the mountains and we're all going to die of coronavirus because nobody's going to develop the vaccine because we're all meditating. First of all, not everybody wants to go to the mountains and meditate. Not everybody is going to benefit from going to the mountains and meditate. Not everybody who thinks they will benefit from going to the mountains and meditate will benefit. Okay? And so people have different talents, different abilities, different motivations. And so you can work to help people right now, and that becomes a cause for your awakening. Okay? So people sometimes ask me, if everybody became a monk or a nun, what would happen to all the Buddhists? And I usually say, yeah, show me when that's going to happen. You know? So let, let's think more realistically. This says when... Uh, when the present becomes your preoccupation, that sounds like it really concerns. Not like meditating on just the presence, the present moment, understanding that the future will mm -hmm. take care of itself. And it says it also says the future doesn't matter. So this isn't a person who's who's really focusing on their staying in the present while they're focusing on their long term goals. It sounds like someone who has lost their motivation. Yeah. Well, it's somebody whose motivation is the eight worldly concerns. Yeah. Hmm? They uh, lost well, their Dharma motivation or they never had one. 
Or maybe they didn't have one, yeah. Okay. But it's confusing for people who are just coming to Buddhism when they hear, be in the present moment, but work for your future, create the good causes for your future life, create the causes for awakening, because they can't put those two things together. Okay? So the thing is, okay, when... You, like she said, when you're living in the moment you're cre- and you have a dharma mind, you're creating virtue, you're abandoning non-virtue, your mind is very focused, you are not distracted by thinking about uh, the future in terms of future uh, eight worldly concerns, okay? So your mind is not distracted from the future, not distracted from the present in which you're creating virtue by thinking about, oh, in the future I will be born as a universal market mar- uh, monarch. In the future, because of my generosity, I will have wealth. Uh, in the future, everybody will know how rich I am because I'm so generous now. So your mind is not distracted by those thoughts of the future. And that enables you to be here and use your present time to do something virtuous. Whether you're developing a back vaccine or going into retreat or, you know, doing something else, yeah, it enables you to, to focus on having a good motivation and carrying out that action, yeah. But you are quite aware of the future and that causes and conditions work and we have to create the causes for the kind of future we want okay but being in the present does not mean enjoying the eight worldly concerns okay it means not being distracted by thinking about them in the future yeah and, and similarly, you know, when they say don't have hopes, don't have fears, it doesn't mean that you can never generate a, a hope, may all sentient beings be well, you know. It doesn't mean that you never practice the, the four immeasurables because they're full of hope and, and the text says don't have hope and don't have fears, okay. What it's meaning is don't have hopes for worldly benefit okay don't have fear of worldly uh, disaster okay what you do want to have hope for is you're creating the causes for awakening what you do want to fear is your ignorance and your self-centered thought okay So these different statements that we hear, either in the scriptures or from different teachers, we have to understand exactly what they mean. Otherwise, we get quite confused. Yeah. The way that I also read this is that um, for someone who who lives a very hedonistic lifestyle, um, there's not a whole lot of... uh, importance given to either, you know, developing their ethical side or developing their uh, wisdom side or the compassion side because their mind is absorbed by the uh, seeking pleasure at the moment, in that moment. And so in order for all of us to uh, try to uh, cultivate all of these mm, mental states, and we have to give up on that search for daily pleasure. Mm-hmm. We have to focus our mind on a different, you know, different objects. And so, this is to me what this paragraph is telling me: mm-hmm. that hedonism is not going to be conducive to my uh, eventual, my spiritual progress. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And the thing is, if you don't have hopes and fears about the future, you're going to be a lot happier than if you have hopes and fears. Yeah? Because when you have hopes and fears, you're attached to a certain outcome that may or may not come. When you have fears, you're afraid of a certain outcome 
And so instead of making peace with it or preparing for it, you get all tied up in knots.